Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics Vaccine Hesitancy Training. We want to thank CareSource for their support for these trainings. We had our kickoff training um, a little bit ago, and our next training will be on vaccine health as well. We're excited to share the series with you and are thankful for those that have registered. CareSource does not influence this content. And again, thank you for their support. The next training will be on vaccine health and how to communicate with families in diverse and underserved communities. And then we have two trainings on lead and two trainings on childhood obesity. We also have created a new resource like the last resource we had created about vaccines, uh, myths and facts, and how to address that with the families that you all work with. I will send this out in an email after the training today, and we would love any feedback that you have on it. We will also send a survey after the training, and that's how you'll receive your certificate for participation. And there's two CMEs also available for this training. Throughout the training, please keep your lines muted and your video cameras off and um, please ask any questions that you have in the chat box and we will get to them throughout the training or at the end. Our speakers today are Dr. David Karras and Dr. Lou Edgy, and they will each introduce themselves before they start speaking. Again, please let us know if you have any questions throughout the training. We thank you all for joining us and thank you for all that you do for children in Ohio. Now I will pass it over to Dr. Karras and let him introduce himself and get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm very excited to talk about vaccine hesitancy. Uh, I'm a general pediatrician with Akron Children's Hospital. Um, and certainly vaccines are one of the most important things that we talk about when it comes to children's health. And so I'm very excited to speak with you all uh, about vaccine hesitancy and hopefully what we can do to overcome it. I would say that um, the subtitle for this talk should probably be Be Curious, Not Judgmental. Uh, and some of you may have heard this quote uh, from Ted Lasso, which is one of the most beautiful TV shows I've seen. It's on Apple Plus. Um, but really, it was said by Walt Whitman. Um, but I want you to kind of keep this in the back of your mind as we start to talk about vaccines and the reasons that people have for vaccine hesitancy. Next. Uh, I do have a commercial interest to disclose. I am on the Speakers Bureau for Merck, uh, which is the manufacturer of the HPV cancer vaccine Gardasil. Um, there are some Gardasil slides in here, but we will not talk about any unapproved or investigative use. Next. So the objectives for today, uh, we're gonna hopefully be able to explain the history of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, you should be able to discuss some of the common misconceptions that we see, and hopefully we'll explore some ways to move families towards acceptance of vaccines. Next. So first of all, vaccines are not new. In fact, they've been around for a long, long time. Uh, so this very sad, very distressed looking child has smallpox. Uh, and why did they call it smallpox? Uh, it certainly does not look small, it looks horrible. Uh, but it was called smallpox because it was not the great pox, which was syphilis. However, uh, the impact of smallpox has probably been significantly greater uh, than any of the other things that we see. Uh, after a few days or weeks of exposure, a person would develop fever, vomiting, uh, significant mouth ulcers, and then ultimately uh, that very severe looking rash. Uh, and smallpox is bad for you. It had about a 30% fatality rate. Uh, and it's been with humanity for a long, long time. Evidence of it has been found in Egyptian mummies. Uh, and the impact of society is hard to overestimate. Uh, in fact, just in the 20th century alone, uh, over 300 million people died of smallpox. Next. 
So how did we combat smallpox? Well, uh, we've been fighting it for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, back in the 10th century, uh, people had identified that airborne transmission seemed to result in a much more severe case of disease with a much higher fatality rate, and that skin infections were significantly mild and that most people were able to recover. And so there is evidence from as far back as the 10th century in China uh, that physicians then were already performing inoculations. Uh, and this was easy. All you have to do is find a buddy with smallpox, uh, ask if you could borrow some of their scabs, grind them up into a nice powder, and put it in your nose or into a small cut. Seems like a great way to prevent disease. Uh, and doing this only had a 3% fatality rate compared to that 30% that you'd see with smallpox disease. Um, and so it, while it's certainly better than the alternative, um, 3% fatality is certainly nowhere near the level that we would be comfortable with today. Um, but again, physicians uh, as far back as the 10th century were performing this. Next. If we fast forward a few centuries uh, into the 1700s, we come to the time of Edward Jenner. Um, and it was not just Edward Jenner. Lots of people uh, in Great Britain had identified uh, that there were some things that we might be able to do to prevent or at least to minimize smallpox. Uh, and in fact, they had identified that milkmaids uh, very rarely got smallpox. However, they did get cowpox which was a very similar viral infection that cows got. Uh, and when women were milking the cows, they could develop uh, so cowpox sores on their hands. But it seemed that infection with cowpox uh, could induce lifelong protection against smallpox. And so physicians throughout Great Britain were testing it. Um, and Dr. Jenner published this in 1798. Uh, he would scrape pus from uh, a woman with uh, cowpox and inject it into the patient's arms uh, to see if he could prevent them from developing smallpox. And so he did that uh, and later exposed those patients to smallpox, uh, and uh, they did not develop smallpox disease. Uh, again, imagine doing this today, coming up with a possible vaccine for meningitis, uh, and then exposing a child to meningitis to see if it worked. Um, certainly we don't do that now, um, but times were different. Um, and Jenner published his work in 1798. And uh, the vaccination movement to protect uh, the world against smallpox got started. Uh, so again, vaccines have been with us for uh, over 200 years. Uh, so vaccination is certainly not new. But what about vaccine hesitancy? When did that come about? Next. So uh, here we have an illustration of uh, possible side effects from that cowpox vaccine. Uh, you can see uh, cows literally growing out of the body parts of people who have been vaccinated. Um, to my knowledge, there are no case reports of that actually happening. Um, but certainly people were concerned about the risks of mixing bovine humors with human humors uh, and were afraid about what would happen. Uh, so this was published by the Anti-Vaccine Society in 1802. Uh, so within four years of Jenner's successful discovery, uh, the anti-vaccine movement uh, was already up and running. Next. So let's move on to more modern vaccine hesitancy um, and looking at what people have been concerned about, uh, looking at what the data actually say and what we can do uh, to reassure our patients and families that vaccines are safe and effective. Well, it was in 1998 uh, that former Dr. Andrew Wakefield uh, published a study in Lancet uh, suggesting that MMR vaccine could increase the risk of autism. This was not a good study. There were 12 patients. There were no controls. There were some very serious 
serious scientific misrepresentations and ethical violations. Uh, not only was Wakefield funded by lawyers who were suing man vaccine manufacturers, so he had a very significant conflict of interest, uh, but many of these patients were already having symptoms prior to vaccination. Uh, and so his study was eventually retracted uh, by the journal uh, and eventually he did lose his medical license. Next. So now we have lots of concerns about uh, vaccines and the risks that they may carry. And I suspect that you've heard about lots of these. Um, we still very commonly hear the myth that vaccines can increase risk for autism. Many families are concerned about ingredients in the vaccines, uh, things like mercury, aluminum, formaldehyde, when really these risks are very, very, very low. Uh, there's no longer any mercury in most of the pediatric vaccines. Uh, aluminum is used as an adjuvant uh, to help increase the immune response, but again, the levels are very, very low. Uh, you probably get more aluminum from a can of soda than you do from a vaccine. Uh, formaldehyde is a preservative, but it is manufactured by our own bodies and present in our own bodies at rates that are higher uh, than those in the vaccine. So none of those are dangerous. Families uh, may be concerned about getting too many vaccines at once or feel that natural immunity would be better. More recently, with uh, the HPV cancer vaccines, families have had concerns about infertility uh, or encouraging their children to be, become more promiscuous. And even more recently with COVID vaccine, we've heard fears about induced magnetism and something to do with 5G cell networks. Next. So there are lots of challenges that we face um, when dealing with vaccine myths um, and uh, erroneous fears about vaccines. Uh, and a lot of this, unfortunately, do, does have to do with the media. Uh, and that's not just social media, uh, but traditional media as well. Uh, news organizations are very quick to jump on any story that seems exciting or sensational. Uh, and certainly any time it involves the death of a child or a teenager, uh, that is something that society should be concerned about and should want to know about. But we need to do our due diligence and make sure that we're reporting things that are actually true. Um, you are way ahead of some of my slides. Can we go back a few? All right, next. Um, so some might be missing, but uh, here is a case of a girl who died within a few hours of receiving her HPV vaccine. Uh, and the story says that the National Health Services Trust in Great Britain suspended vaccination for all children uh, after this 14-year-old um, died. Next. However, uh, her cause of death was not HP vaccine. In fact, it was found that she had uh, a large chest tumor. Uh, and so vaccine uh, did not cause her tumor and did not contribute to her death. It was purely coincidental. Um, but once that story gets out um, that she died after HP vaccine, obviously that causes very significant concern uh, and lowers the level of trust that families are gonna have uh, in vaccines. Next. Uh, another issue we see is that uh, sometimes there are reports that are true, um, but you have to look at them in context. For instance, we have uh, in our country, and Great Britain has as well, um, a way to report vaccine side effects, some possible injuries due to vaccines. This is a passive reporting system. Uh, and so we're never gonna be able to capture all of the adverse events. Um, but you have to be very careful with these kind of data. So uh, here a story looked at the number of adverse reactions reported uh, in patients that had received vaccine. Uh, they estimated that that was 10% of the true number. So they just multiplied it by 10 and suddenly you have 80,000 kids that are having adverse events. Uh, but again, these are passive reporting systems. Anyone can report on them. Um, and just because a 
adverse event is listed does not mean that it is because of the vaccine. Uh, we have to go back and look at the rates of those illnesses throughout the community. And so, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times these news reports are going to report deaths prior to autopsy. Again, these sensational stories certainly get more clicks. And the media does feel the need often to present both sides of an argument equally. Uh, the challenge there is that one side may have lots of data and evidence and facts uh, and the other side does not. So it is really a false equivalence. Uh, having one vaccine skeptic uh, is not the same as having thousands of um, healthcare professionals who advocate for vaccines. Next. And unfortunately, during the COVID-19 era, um, things have become even more contentious. Uh, we know that events of the past decade have led to significantly increased polarization in our country, uh, decreased pluralism, and a significantly heightened, heightened group identity. Um, additionally, uh, social media and the internet uh, really contribute to that. Search algorithms uh, work real hard to give us searches that are similar to other things that we've searched on. Um, so if you've uh, looked up things about the election. Um, it may also show you some things about vaccine hesitancy. Certainly social media works the same way. And even the traditional media will polarize things and sensationalize them to try to increase revenue. Uh, anything they can do to generate more clicks. And the more that people identify with their group, the more they accept that group's beliefs. Um, and I think we can all see that how that has impacted um, our country, that people have um, just become more and more tied to the groups that they identify with. Uh, and again, they're much more likely to believe the things that their group believes um, and be less amenable to hearing things from the outside. And anti-vaccination really does span the political parties. On the far left, we have distrust of big pharma. Um, many people on the left also believe that all natural is the best way to go and are hesitant about putting uh, foreign things into their bodies. Uh, on the far right, we see significant distrust of the government, uh, suspicion of the scientific establishment, and obviously cherishing personal freedoms. I certainly love my freedoms as well, um, but certainly they don't want mandates um, even when it can uh, contribute significantly to public health. So my advice is stay away from the extremes. Um, we all need to work together to do what's right uh, for our patients and families. So while we know that ideology can have a very strong impact on trust in government experts, uh, next. Data does show that their political worldview does not seem to influence how much people trust their primary healthcare provider. And that is really, really good news. Next. Because it tells us that our patients and families do trust us. Uh, and while they may not listen to an expert on the news uh, or in a newspaper, um, they do trust their health care provider. Um, so whether it's their community health worker, a visiting nurse, their primary care pediatrician, um, families do trust us and they want to hear from us and they do want to hear our opinions on vaccination. Next. So um, what is the best way to talk about vaccines with families? Well, lots of data have shown that the best way to start is with a presumptive delivery strategy uh, to assume that patients uh, want to receive vaccines that day. Um, and so we can say for a teenage visit, uh, for example, uh, today your child will get their diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis booster, their HPV cancer vaccine, and their meningitis vaccine. If the family says yes, or at least if they don't say no, 
great, your work is done. You can get them vaccinated uh, and get them protected against very severe disease. Next. But what if they say no? Um, and truthfully, this is one of the biggest challenges that many of us face. Um, it's an uncomfortable conversation. We certainly don't uh, want to argue or have um, some of these more personal conversations with families, but there are ways to do this easily and to do it well. Uh, and the first thing I'd recommend uh, is going back to that Walt Whitman quote, be curious, not judgmental. So if we respond with genuine curiosity and empathy, then families are much more likely to uh, talk about and disclose the real concerns that they have. And if we demonstrate that real empathy and show that we have listened to them, they're much more likely to listen back. Remember, parents are only refusing vaccines because they believe that that is in the best interest of their children. So we actually have the same goal. We want what's best for our kids. Uh, and we just need to figure out how to do that. And again, having an argument or an attack is only going to make people feel defensive. Uh, so uh, yelling at them or um, creating a very conflict-heavy argument or discussion with that family is going to immediately turn them off to what they have to say. It's only going to make them more defensive and have them dig in their heels. And so really it's creating that comfortable and safe environment where we can have those conversations where it's really gonna be important if we ever hope to change anyone's mind. Next. So for many people, vaccine hesitancy is not due to a knowledge deficit. It's not that they don't know enough. It's often due to cultural beliefs and perceived risks. And it's very rare that just presenting evidence or data or a flyer is gonna overcome that. Um, again, our cultural identities are very, very strong. We're very, very tied to the groups with, to whom we belong. And so just getting a piece of paper at the doctor's office is probably not gonna change your mind. And we have to be able to identify what those barriers really are. And we can only identify those barriers by asking. Next. So when families say no, we can simply ask, what are your concerns about the vaccine? Uh, if we don't ask, we're never gonna know. And really there's a huge continuum of vaccine acceptance. Uh, we all have patients and families that uh, are fully embracing vaccines and will accept any vaccine that you offer them. There are many families that will accept them, but have some hesitancy, have some concerns about it. Uh, we certainly have lots of families that will delay vaccines or try to make up their own schedule or pick and choose which vaccines they want, and which ones they refuse. Uh, and then far on the left-hand side, we have those families that refuse all vaccines. Um, obviously, many of those families are in what we call the pre-contemplative state of change, uh, and they're not even willing to talk about vaccines yet, and that's okay. Um, it is unlikely that you're going to change those families' minds, so you don't have to fight with them about it. You don't have to lose sleep about it, but it's something that we can continue to have that conversation with them about in the future. Next. And again, there are so many reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And unless we ask families, we're not gonna know what the barriers are that are keeping them from getting their child vaccinated. Some people legitimately do have medical concerns, concerns about safety or efficacy or the risks to their child. Uh, other families may have uh, religious uh, objections to receiving vaccines. Um, I've certainly, uh, heard this from many families, and again, sometimes talking about what their concerns may be may be enough to overcome them. Um, but I've also heard families say, I prayed about it, and God told me not to get the COVID vaccine. Um, I don't know whether God really told them that or not, um, but my suspicion is you're probably not going to change their mind about that. 
Again, families may have cultural objections. Uh, certainly we know there are communities that have been uh, discriminated against by the healthcare um, profession who have even been experimented with in unethical ways uh, by the medical profession. And we certainly understand uh, why those communities are hesitant to bring their children in to get some kind of unknown vaccine. And certainly there are political and personal reasons as well. Uh, so let's look at some of the easy questions uh, and talk about how we can address those. So first, do vaccines work? Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, so again, smallpox, which has been with mankind for thousands and thousands of years, was successfully eradicated in 1980. There is no more smallpox disease anywhere in the world. Uh, there still are some vials of smallpox virus, uh, both in Russia and the United States. I've heard uh, both sides on the debate about whether or not we need to keep those, um, but uh, they're still there. And so uh, we certainly hope they don't get accidentally or purposely released into the wild, um, but there is currently no smallpox disease. Polio is very likely to be the next disease that we eradicate. Uh, vaccination strategies across the world have been very effective. There are now only uh, endemic uh, polio disease in Pakistan and Afghanistan. In fact, most of the polio we now see worldwide uh, is actually polio that is mutated from the vaccine strain. Uh, and so more people get polio from the vaccine um, than they get from wild type polio. And so if we can just finally get everyone vaccinated, uh, we can eradicate polio as well. Um, and here's a graph looking at measles rates. Um, so in the 50s, we were seeing over half a million cases of measles each year. Uh, then with the advent of measles vaccine, you can see how significant that impact was uh, on measles rates. Uh, and when the second dose was recommended, measles rates went down even lower. Uh, and now we may see one or 200 cases per year. So yes, the vaccine certainly works. Next. Are vaccines safe? Well, I'm pleased to say that yes, yes, they are. We've got a very robust process uh, of vaccine tracking. Uh, certainly while the vaccines are being developed, uh, they go through multiple phases of testing, both for safety and for e efficacy. And we continue to track the safety of those vaccines long-term. We know that serious side effects are very rare, probably only one or two severe allergic reactions per millions of doses. Uh, and again, after the vaccine has been um, put on the market, we have our vaccine adverse event reporting system, which allows anyone uh, to report a possible vaccine side effect. Next. Uh, and in fact, this is one of my favorite stories. Um, so we're gonna look at a case study on a vaccine called RotaShield. This was a rotavirus vaccine that was approved in August of 98. Um, and rotavirus really is or was a big deal. It was the leading cause of vomiting and diarrhea in infants and the leading cause uh, of hospitalization. Uh, and so the ability to prevent that was very, very excited. Um, they did identify that a few cases of kids who were in the trials developed what was called intussusception. Uh, this is an illness where the bowel kind of telescopes in on itself and causes a bowel obstruction and can be potentially very, very serious. So again, they had identified some kids who had received the vaccine developed in inception during the trials, but it was not statistically significant. So the rates did not seem to be higher than those in the general population. Normal rates, probably about one in 3,000. However, RotaShield did increase the risk by a small amount, about one to two in 10,000. Um, but that risk was high enough that we were able to identify it um, through vaccine uh, adverse events reporting after the vaccine uh, was uh, brought onto the market. Uh, and so again, we know that our vaccine system is very safe. 
So how long did it take from licensure to um, identifying that this was a risk and pulling it from the market? Next. Nine months. To me, that is amazing. And the fact that uh, in only nine months, we were able to identify the small but real increased risk of interception and pull this vaccine from the market. So uh, again, I think it's such a powerful story that highlights um, that we do have a very good system in place for uh, measuring vaccine safety. Next. Will too many vaccines overload the immune system? And the answer is yes. Uh, administering 10,000 vaccines at once uh, would very likely deplete a person's B cell capacity. Um, but we do not do 10,000 vaccines at once. The most we normally do is four or five, sometimes six or seven, um, but certainly not gonna get anywhere near the ability uh, to uh, impact our immune system ability to fight off other illnesses. Uh, in fact, the immunization that schedule that we have and is recommended by the ICFP has been tested and is safe. And in fact, there are no data on any alternative schedule schedules. So I would say that for my part, if a family is wanting to space out their vaccines or use an alternative schedule, uh, I'm not going to fight them about it too much other than to say that, um, you know, again, the schedule that we have and recommend has been tested and found to be safe. Um, and sometimes it's better just to get it over with. Next. Do vaccines cause autism? Uh, certainly there's probably no other question that has been asked more times about vaccines and probably Nothing that has been researched more heavily. Um, many large scale studies have been shown, have shown that there is no link between vaccines and autism. Uh, thimerosal was a preservative that contained mercury that was present in some vaccines and there was concern uh, that that mercury could accumulate uh, over time and cause um, developmental disabilities. Uh, it was only a theoretical risk. Again, there's no studies that showed um, that there was any increased risk, but because it was a theoretical risk, it was removed from all of the pediatric vaccines. And since then, there's been no decrease in the rates of autism. Um, is autism on the rise? Yeah, it sure seems to be. Uh, is some of it due to just increased provider awareness and family awareness? Uh, it's certainly possible, um, but we certainly know that uh, it certainly looks like autism on, on the rise. But again, there's probably not anything that has been tested more uh, as whether or not vaccines are contributing to that rise. And we are very, very comfortable saying that there is no increased risk of autism as a result of getting your vaccines. Next. Are vaccines made from aborted fetuses? Kind of. Uh, so varicella, rubella, hepatitis A, and the Johnson Johnson COVID-19 vaccines are grown in human cell cultures that were attained from aborted fetuses many, many decades, decades ago. There is not any human tissue in the vaccines. Um, so are they grown in aborted fetuses? No, this is a cell culture. Uh, not any different than scraping some cells from inside your cheek and getting them to grow. Um, but the fact is that many human viruses grow better in human cells, and so sometimes that is the best uh, place to grow them. Uh, but even the Vatican has said uh, that uh, believers should not have any concern about using the vaccines um, because they are safe and effective. Next. Is my child at risk of getting that disease? Well, it really depends on the disease. Is your child really at risk for polio? Probably not, uh, unless they're traveling to Afghanistan or Pakistan. Uh, are they at risk of strep pneumo? Yes, strep pneumo is the leading cause of ear infections and pneumonia and meningitis. And if they don't get vaccinated, they will certainly get one of those things. Are they at risk of chickenpox? Probably. 
and it will be yucky. The older you are when you get check and pox, the worse that it's gonna be. What about cervical cancer? Um, well, it depends. If you're a man, your risk is very low, but if you're a woman, the risk is very high. In fact, probably one in 45 unvaccinated and unscreened women will go on to develop cervical cancer. Uh, and even with regular screening, that rate can be as high as one in 500. Compare that to the risk of a severe reaction to the vaccine, which is just one in a million. And we can clearly see that um, vaccination is definitely safer than the disease. Next. So let's look at the COVID-19 vaccines for a little bit. Uh, so we've got uh, three that are approved in the United States. We've got the Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, and Moderna that are both an mRNA or messenger RNA for uh, the spike protein on the coronavirus. And the Johnson & Johnson uses an adenovirus vector with the spike protein DNA. Uh, so they take the spike protein, they identify the genetic code required to make it, and they wrap it in a little bubble of fat that gets injected into the arm and then it merges with our cells and uh, releases that messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is what our cells use to create the protein. So the cell looks and says, oh, here's a nice recipe for a protein. I should start making that uh, and starts making some spike proteins that then get moved to the outside of the cell uh, where our immune system can identify it and then use that to create antibodies against it. Um, again, it does not make any viruses. It does not have the ability to give you COVID. Uh, the messenger RNA and the spike proteins all get degraded within a matter of hours. Um, and then hopefully we have nice protection from the antibodies that are created. Next. It does have side effects. Certainly it can have pain, redness, and swelling at the site like any vaccine can. Uh, and we know that COVID vaccine can have some uh, worsening side effects, often worse with the second dose. Uh, you can be tired, headache, muscle pain, chill, chills, fever. Um, but again, the rates of severe uh, reactions are very low, maybe two to 11 per million doses of anaphylaxis. Uh, we know that there is likely increased a blood clot in women from the J&J, &J, uh, maybe seven per million. And we have certainly seen that young males are at risk of myocarditis, a type of heart inflammation as a result uh, of COVID vaccine, maybe as high as 35 per million. But again, we know that the rates of myocarditis due to COVID disease are much, much higher. Next. So can you get COVID from the shot? No. Will it make you infertile? No. Will it change your DNA? No. Will it make you magnetic? I doubt it. Does it contain microchips that track me with 5G? I don't think that's a thing. Uh, in fact, every one of you probably has a cell phone in your pocket that in fact does track you using 5G. So uh, the vaccine is not gonna do anything that your phone doesn't already do uh, as far as letting Apple or Google know where you are and what you are doing at all times. So if you're worried about 5G, uh, don't throw away the vaccine, throw away your phone. Uh, and we know that the vaccine is very, very effective. In fact, 99% of COVID deaths now are among the unvaccinated. Next. So what do you do? Well, when dealing with families or patients that are hesitant to receiving vaccines, we know that there are things that are not gonna work. Paternalism doesn't work anymore. We can't tell people to do it because we said so. Arguing is not gonna work. It's just gonna make people more defensive uh, and more likely to dig in their heels and become entrenched in their, um, in their ideas. What we need to do is build that empathetic and caring relationship. When families know that you actually care about them as people are willing to listen to their ideas and their concerns and talk to them about what they're concerned about, that is really how we can overcome a lot of the fears that families have. It's not a doctor and a patient, but two people together trying to figure out what is best for a child that they both care about. And that's really how we are going to make a difference uh, in getting our um, patients and families vaccinated. Um, so uh, when dealing with families, whether it's in the clinic or in their homes, 
um, again, having these real and meaningful conversations can be so important. And I, I certainly hope that we've given you some tools uh, to address those uh, conversations. Next. Again, emotions and stories are often going to be much more persuasive than the facts. Uh, I can show you a graph of the impact of chickenpox vaccine on uh, chickenpox rates. Um, but that may not be convincing. What may be convincing is that I can tell you that I've seen children in the ICU with chickenpox pneumonia and how severe that was and how much it impacted them. Um, and so we know that these diseases can be very severe and potentially deadly. So if you have stories of people who have been impacted by vaccine preventable disease, that can certainly be very helpful. Um, did you get your children vaccinated? Did you research vaccine safety and efficacy prior to making that decision for your own kids? Uh, certainly something that is, that is something that can be very powerful for families as well. And uh, the Ohio AP does have lots of resources on uh, dealing with vaccine hesitancy. In fact, we've got a couple programs that uh, offices can use to improve their vaccination rates. We've got both the Maximizing Offense-Based Immunizations and the Teen Immunization Education Series. Um, AAP staff can come out to your office and do uh, chart audits and see how well you're doing and offer uh, suggestions and ways to improve vaccination rates at your site. Next. Um, we've got our Ohio Champions for Vaccines program where anyone can um, participate and spread the pro-vaccine messages. Next. Um, we've got lots of immunization resources on the website. We've got brochures um, that you can print out. Next. And we've got the Fast Vax website that allows you to even type in questions uh, that you or families may have, and it gives long uh, options and answers to all those questions um, put together uh, by actual scientists and docs who care about vaccines. Um, and lots of COVID-19 resources as well, all available on the Ohio AAP website. So in summary, vaccine hesitancy is just as old as vaccines. Um, but if we're curious and not judgmental and build that real personal, respectful, and empathetic bond, we actually do have the ability uh, to convince families that vaccinations is safe and important. And that relationship that you build in that home or in that exam room really can be more powerful uh, than the misinformation that they have been exposed to. I've included some references both uh, for my slides and for the Ohio AAP resources. And uh, as I said, I'm Dave Karras. Um, there's my email and uh, certainly would be uh, happy to contact, uh, be in contact with any of you. And so feel free to email me with any questions. So thanks so much for your time. I certainly hope that this has been helpful uh, as you go out and talk to patients and families about the importance of vaccination. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Karras. And all of the resources and slides will be sent out after the training. So you'll be able to access those and all the Ohio AAP resources. Next, we have Dr. Um, Edgy. I will let her introduce herself and then we will get started in, on combating COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in Black and Latinx communities. Dr. Edgy. Thank you so much. I'm gonna actually go ahead and share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yep. You're good, Lou. Okay, great. 
All right, so thank you so much for having me and for that excellent talk that um, we had just beforehand. It really um, level sets and sets some ground um, foundation for the, the talk I'm gonna do in just a bit here. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the Black and Latinx communities and um, talk a little bit about some of the um, tools that I found useful um, as I have um, had a different perspective. I think I bring three different perspectives to this discussion. Um, number one, I am um, in the Moderna trial and um, that started off because I had a death in the family um, and subsequently before the, the, um, the EUA from Moderna came through, I had three additional deaths and then we've had none since then in the family. But then also I'm a physician and I wanted to make sure that as a Moderna trial participant that I could go ahead and speak to my patients and um, you know, be able to have some credibility behind, um, you know, what the process was and what was going on with the vaccines. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, I am the Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education at the University of Cincinnati. So essentially, um, residents and fellows um, are folks who are training in their specialty area. And my job really is to make sure that their education is um, up to par, um, that they're getting all the resources they need for that, and that they're able to launch from a really good, healthy um, educational base into their careers. Um, I am a family physician, so I have a little bit of a different perspective, but um, take care of kids of all ages. Um, my youngest is 17 months old. So the objectives really are threefold. Number one, to be able to say why vaccine hesitancy is important in our pursuit of health equity. Uh, number two, to be um, familiar with some causes of vaccine hesitancy. There'll be a tiny bit of overlap, um, but not much with Dr. Karras's. And then also to speak about four analogies that I found really helpful um, as um, I went through and have, have really talked in multiple different forums um, about, about this. So, Number one, talking about equality versus equity. Equality really is everyone gets exactly the same thing. So you see these crates are exactly the same size, but not everyone can see the baseball game. Here, equity is different. You provide what you need. It's outcomes-based, meaning that um, everyone really wants to see the baseball game. Let's get everyone to, to that point, regardless of what it takes underneath here. And then the last one here is inclusive design, which is really trying to make sure that we actually have a, um, a system that is set up to where everyone can see the baseball game and not need any extra um, help. If you were to put that in the context of um, vaccines, um, First of all, equality would be same size crate. Everyone gets um, a vaccine and it's free for everybody. But the thing about it is equity is different. Everyone out, everyone becomes vaccinated. It's outcomes oriented. And so to do that, you really have to acknowledge some uncomfortable truths that have littered the pathway to discussion about vaccines for a lot of people. Um, we'll talk about one of those incidents. You also have to break down barriers, for example, to access. If we have vaccine drive-through clinics and somebody does not have a car, well, that's not gonna, that free vaccine is not helpful without us addressing some of those barriers. And then everyone gets vaccinated. So again, equality would be free vaccine for all, but equity would mean let's make sure that everyone becomes vaccinated. What is health equity? It really is the assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. And it requires three major principles. First of all, that we have to value individuals and populations equally, that we have to recognize historic injustices, and we have to provide resources according to the need. Again, number of crates that are needed um, to get the same outcome. And the whole purpose of having, um, having a focus on this is that health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. So we have to have them lockstep with each other to actually achieve um, equal health for everybody. So. Vaccine hesitancy, what we do know, and this is from um, the NAACP um, coronavirus uh, hesitancy study, and it actually shows that Black Americans, 55% uh, know somebody who has been diagnosed with COVID, 48% know somebody who's died or been hospitalized. Among Latinx, that's a little bit higher with 73% who know somebody and 52 who have um, known somebody who's hospitalized or died. As far as that goes, we also know that as far as trust goes, and Dr. Karras touched on this a little bit, trust in vaccine safety, you see how low those numbers are for Black Americans, it's 14%, a little bit higher in Latinx. And then trust in the effectiveness, also really low at 18% for Blacks and um, 40 for Latinx. And then trust in culturally specific testing. This was really important. Um, Moderna actually halted their trial nationwide. They had 90 sites of which UC Health is one of them, um, but they halted their trial to make sure that the percentage of 
folks who were in the trial were actually um, reflective of the percentage of Black and Latinx individuals in the community so that we could go to those communities and say, yes, this was tested in us and to help to eliminate one of the hesitancy concerns. Additionally, um, if you look at uh, trust as far as leaders, um, trust in Black versus white community leaders, a Black um, patient is twice as likely to trust somebody who looks like them when they're relaying information. I take care of many Black patients in my community, and I get that all the time. I've had a patient who just, I walked into the room, and within a minute, we had hugged because she was crying when I walked in. She said, I've never had a Black doctor before. This helps me not to have to explain some shared experiences that we've had. Um, also, trust in healthcare providers um, is very high. So that's something that's an important avenue to use in discussions. Also, believe it or not, Dr. Fauci has very high ratings um, in the Black and Latinx community, and uh, so does the FDA. Um, less so the drug companies, um, as you see down there at uh, 19%. One of the things that um, was a big concern, this is um, back the Tuskegee um, Institute trial. Basically, this was uh, back in 1932, we had 623 black men who were approached on behalf of the US Public Health Service, faith leaders, community servants, and also the medical profession. So trusted people, and we're told that they were gonna get free healthcare and free meals, um, and they were gonna be treated for syphilis. Um, the, they, it was a study on syphilis. At that time, penicillin had not been discovered, but over the course of the 40 years of the trial, um, that was actually discovered and it was withheld from them. Um, additionally, and this is one piece that was very compelling to me as a physician, a letter was sent to all the physicians in the area to not treat these individuals if they came for healthcare at their offices. But again, it, was, it wasn't until 40 years later that the Washington Star News published an article exposing um, the fact that these gentlemen were, were essentially left to fend for themselves uh, within the trial without getting treatment. Lots of things have happened actually since then. So for example, institutional review boards are out there right now. So an IRB is something that um, has been put into place to make sure that there are ethical standards that are met um, as um, as individuals are in trials, and there has to be training for everyone who's gonna have a trial that involves humans. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but just mentioning things like that is very helpful. Um, the other thing is, um, this here is Kismeke Corbett. She is actually um, a scientist. She's one of the two lead scientists that discovered the Moderna um, vaccine. And the importance here is, as we mentioned before, there's a high trust with Dr. Fauci, mentioning when I speak to patients that she works in Dr. Fauci's lab and works with him, it actually does help to increase the confidence in that space, um, as well as the fact that she, she looks like some of the patients that I speak to. As we move from vaccine hesitant to vaccine hopeful, um, we look at some of the data um, that is coming out right now out of the Kaiser Family Foundation. And this is um, a very, it's an interactive thing. You can actually just Google it and it will give you up-to-date information and updates about every week or so. But um, basically you can actually go ahead and click on certain buttons for different races that you wanna check to see what their um, attitudes and responses are. So right here, um, this slide is on the vaccine enthusiasm and the Navy line, the very dark one that's going up, that's got 70% there at the, at the uh, right side of it, just shows that, um, that those are individuals who have already gotten the vaccine or will get it as soon as possible. So for black adults, it's high. But if you go to the um, dark green line um, that starts to uptick at 16% at the right side of the screen there, um, it just goes to show that we're actually getting a slowdown in the enthusiasm. And part of that between December 2020 to now um, has been with um, the boosters. And I think some sentiment that um, having a booster proves that the original didn't work, which is a fallacy that is incorrect. If you go then and look at Hispanic adults with the same information, you have 66% um, that say, absolutely, I've already gotten it. I'll get it as soon as possible. You've got more of a straight line on those who say, mm, definitely won't get it. And then for our Caucasian um, uh, patients, we see that there's a fairly um, straight line there for the dark green at 15%, pretty much stayed that way of folks who say they won't get it. 
this next and so summary then for that one is that an increase in vaccine enthusiasm has slowed um, toward um, you know across all racial and ethnic groups except for Caucasian patients. Right here again, this is also Kaiser Family Foundation data, and it keeps track. Um, and we found that there is a bit of a political divide. Um, the lower percentages for patients who have said they already have been vaccinated, um, we see that the lowest numbers here are in the Republicans at 54%, and then also in patients between age 18 and 49, so the two groups between being about 57 and 58%. If you look at folks who are going to be in the definitely not category, based on what we just said, you'd also expect that in the Republican category there, 20% is pretty high saying I will definitely not get it, and also our younger patients. So when we talk about hesitancy, we need to keep this information in mind so that we're actually meeting people where they are when they start this conversation. So this slide looks at the income of parents um, as it relates to their children between age 12 and 17 and the schools. So we find that the parents who actually have a higher income are more likely to be um, have their kids in schools where the school has given them information about um, COVID-19, that the schools have also encouraged them to get vaccinated, um, have mandated that they get vaccinated and have asked about their kids in new status. So higher income parents are more likely to say their child's school has provided COVID-19 information or encouraged it. Here we see that when schools encourage vaccination, the children are more likely to get vaccinated. And you see at the very top blue bar, um, if the school encouraged vaccination, 62% of those kids got their vaccine. If the school did not, it was down at 30%. Also, if the school provided information about COVID vaccine, 58% went ahead and got vaccinated. And if the school did not provide information, then it was down at 32%. And so again, parents whose children's school encouraged vaccination were much more likely to, to have their kids vaccinated. This one right here actually shows concerns of patients, um, of parents who have uh, not gotten their kids vaccinated. And the concern here is, um, Basically, for your Black patients and Latinx, Latinx patients, they were more concerned about side effects than were Caucasian patients. They were also more likely to be concerned about the, uh, fertility and that they would be required um, to have the vaccine when they really didn't want it. Also, if you see at the very bottom here, access was a big issue. Um, and not so much that there weren't tons of vaccines around, but am I gonna be able to be paid for time off work to go ahead and get vaccinated? Is somebody gonna be able to cover my shift while I'm out to get vaccinated or get my child vaccinated? So again, Hispanic and black patients are more likely than white parents to be concerned about access related barriers. And then this last one, um, from Kaiser Family Foundation is um, about shots and the booster. Has that caused you to be more concerned about the effectiveness of COVID-19? And Black and Hispanic adults were more concerned than um, white adults um, about uh, the efficacy and the effectiveness of vaccines since a booster came out. I will also speak personally about access. My um, grandmother, who's in the middle there, is 97 years old. And so when the vaccine was approved back in, um, in December, the mRNA vaccine was approved back in December, she would have been at the top of the age group as a 97 year old woman. But it took her till February, even though my mother who has a doctorate was calling every day to try and get in. Folks were taking the places within our community, driving up from Florida, driving from other places, and she did not have access. So it's very real, even though we had plenty of uh, vaccines as well. Um, barriers, definitely, if you don't have a physician, you're definitely gonna fall through the crack if somebody's not gonna be able to order. Um, luckily, that sort of helped out to have um, free vaccines at pharmacies, and that changed over time. No phone, no internet, no car, no time um, to get off in a work day. Innate skills for physicians, definitely, as Dr. Karras mentioned, um, patient stories are very compelling. Um, there's credibility, and we'll look at that in just a second. Technical and scientific knowledge, access to understanding of research and being able to translate those and um, the information and research into bite-sized nuggets that patients can understand, and then experiencing advocating for individuals, which we really do every day. This slide looks at public trust and physicians really are number three in the list of different folks as far as trust. So, you know, if you're not able to get the message across to a patient, 
definitely referring them to their physician is an important thing to consider as well. As far as the public trust, since the pandemic, we really have seen a change for um, the better and confidence that medical scientists will act in the best interest of the public has gone up between 19, 2019 and 2020. Overall, the view of medical doctors is mostly positive and increasing. And um, Dr. Fauci, uh, as I see here, as I show here, he's um, been instrumental in also um, maintaining his um, political cool all the way through um, multiple different um, uh, regimens of, um, of folks. So whether Democrat or um, Republican um, presidents, he's been able to, um, to be a really useful tool uh, because he's stuck to the science and that's always um, a, a good bet for all of us as well. This slide actually shows that there has been a partisan divide in the confidence of medical scientists and scientists in general, and that Democrats have a more um, trusting uh, basis in science than, um, and that has grown over time, as you can see here in 2019, um, went up from um, 37 to um, 53 in 2020. Um, so again, knowing this information is useful, not to be antagonistic, but to go ahead and actually understand um, things that may need to come up in the discussion if we're really genuinely trying to get people vaccinated. Skills that um, we can develop as um, providers and healthcare workers is to go ahead and define our goals and audience and be specific. We'll talk about that in a second. Crafting our personal stories to frame the issue, developing and sticking to your message. And again, the basis should always be science. Recognizing opportunities for advocacy, they're all over the place. Um, and then developing relationships with partners um, who can be vessels um, to get that information across. So one thing, this I love this slide, um, women, this is information from the CDC, women really are often the chief medical officers of our family. And according to CDC data, 90, I'm sorry, 79% of women pick the family, the family's physician, a pediatrician or family physician, 77% make the medical visit appointments, and then 59% actually make the major health decisions in the family. So very important to make sure you're involving your mothers, um, as you know. I will go over four different analogies that I found helpful. I, I was counting up how many things I've done since the pandemic between podcasts and media events and things like that. I've done 97, this will be 98. Um, and these analogies have been very helpful for me in the course of, of um, talking to patients. So changing uh, the key in a changing lock, icing on the cake, safety deposit box and Snapchat message. And I'll um, do a slide for each one of these. So for the patients who are like, yeah, no doc, I'm good. I'm gonna just wait, wait and see. I want it to you know, percolate a little bit more and then see how it works with everybody else. I think of this, number one, if you think about the virus being a lock, and the vaccine being a key, what you do not wanna do is um, get concerned that your key is not gonna fit in your lock anymore. So when you have a virus, like I said, being the lock, um, when you have a variant, that lock is starting to change shape. It's starting to change its functions, it's starting to change. And you wanna make sure your vaccine still works against your, your um, variant. And so this is why it's really important. So far we have been fortunate in that, yes, our Moderna vaccines and our Pfizer and so forth work very well still against, um, you know, against uh, the Delta variant. But the concern is if we keep on going into Lambda and a couple of others, that that could be a problem. And you don't wanna have to make brand spanking new um, uh, by vaccines to deal with these changing viruses. So it's a race against time. People have to get vaccinated. There's no time to sit on the fence while the variants continue to change. The next one, icing on the cake, this one is for the vaccine was developed way too fast, Dr. Edgy. I don't trust it. It's only been around. You know, I want some more time. For this one, I think about um, the icing on the cake. And we have um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the COVID-19 virus, has actually been, it's a, a, a part of the family of coronaviruses. We have been studying coronaviruses for 20 years. So each one of those cakes is 10 years. So 20 years worth of study. And then when the pandemic hit, all we had to do was determine the genome of the spike protein that Dr. Karras had mentioned before so that we can make the vaccine. That took 66 days. So that was like discovering the flavor of icing and then icing the cake. So this was not a vaccine that took just 11 months to develop. This was 20 years in the making and we just had to find the last little piece um, to get the information across. This third um, analogy of four is the safety deposit box. And this is for the women in particular who are concerned about vaccine um, effects on fertility. And I like to think of a vault. 
And uh, if you think about um, your cell um, con containing DNA, DNA would be a blueprint to make another uh, Lou edgy. And um, that is locked in the nucleus in the cell like a safety deposit box in that vault. When you inject mRNA, it has absolutely zero access to the safety deposit box. It will not change your DNA. It will not change the fetus's DNA. It will not affect fertility of the man or anything like that. And so that is something that has been useful as well. It really does, um, your lockdown uh, is it's way too important um, for your DNA to be um, free and easy in the rest of the cell. The other thing is a Snapchat message. This one is for the vaccine may have harmful side effects on my body. And so a Snapchat message, I don't use Snapchat, but my 23 year old daughter does. It's a message on social media that has just a really short time that it's there and then it disappears. Um, it's not a permanent message. And so I think about the fact that mRNA lasts in the system for about 48 hours. Um, it is very unstable. And so that's why that little lipid droplet called nanoparticle is around it to help inject it into the body and keep it stable for that. But then your side effects only should last about 48 hours if you're gonna have them. So fatigue, um, fever, mild headache, body aches and muscle aches, those are, uh, and joint pain, those are, are really gonna only last from the shot about 48 hours at the most and then it's outside your body. Just briefly on catalytic partnerships, I'm going ahead and um, trying to get the message out and multiplying the effectiveness of what you're saying, um, speaking to community leaders, um, being familiar with Black and Latinx physicians in town, um, faith leaders, local businesses, schools, and primary care, definitely important. So again, I um, last week, it was trial day 382, I got my booster shot. Again, I got into the Moderna trial because I wanted to have the credibility of being able to say, yes, I got my shot too. I did not hesitate this, was, I got my shot the very first one, September 12th. We had no idea whether mRNA technology was gonna work at all at that point. And we all celebrated, all 30,000 of us in the Moderna trial when we found out that it was effective. Um, University of Cincinnati is one of the um, 90 trial sites in the country. Um, the interesting thing and the important thing is that internally the trial team was made of Black and Latinx um, clinical researchers as well. Um, there was a base structure of um, a network within the Black and Latinx community. Shana, who's on the left here, she speaks fluent Spanish and she is the person who is my direct connect. She, she's the one who's, who um, consensed and did all that good stuff with me. And then um, this gentleman who was on the right, uh, unfortunately passed on um, several weeks ago. He, he was Gary, he would take um, blood and I'm still in the trial for a full 25 months to make sure my immunity stays um, good. And so we have a lot of boots on the ground. Then externally, what we did is we went ahead and partnered with key organizations. So the Cincinnati Medical Association is a group of black physicians here in town, equipped them with knowledge. Dr. Fichtenbaum, who is the primary um, lead for the trial, came and spoke at one of our meetings, told us everything about the trial so that we were equipped with tools to talk to our patients. And for that reason, we've also been um, partnering with the Closing the Health Gap so we can meet patients where they are. So Every couple of weeks, we have on a weekend just one hour where people can come back and dip back into the well of knowledge and you know feel more comfortable with um, you know going ahead and getting vaccinated. But we said between 18 and 49 is the age group where folks are most hesitant. Um, we've gone ahead and tried to make sure that we're meeting people with DJs and things like that where they are, where they live. Um, also, just recently did something else with. Um, the school board just to make sure we're getting into the schools and speaking specifically um, to some of the Black and Latinx, Latinx um, parents and, um, and kids. And then my story was picked up way back when I joined the trial and I sort of just had the fortune of um, being able to be involved with all of these different entities in some arena. This right here is also leveraging, um, I'll just go back one, leveraging um, the fact that we're physicians to go ahead and advocate for patients. So this was a letter that was written by um, 450 um, physicians here in town to try and have the school board do mandatory vaccinations for patients. Um, we've also had Cincinnati Black Medical Association go ahead and actually write a letter to all um, the Black um, and Latinx folks in town um, patients to say, we, we really do advocate for you getting this.
Um, and then talking about um, Ohio AAP resources, um, we have a podcast library that is there. Um, and one of these um, we recorded um, earlier in uh, this year um, with our, our president there. And then also um, there are vaccine hesitancy um, uh, other resources that are available. Dr. Karras mentioned some of them, um, but just some where you have a QR code, you can go ahead and get some information on your phone that you can um, utilize and carry around with you. So as far as objectives, one was to be able to articulate why addressing vaccine hesitancy is important, which we did. To be familiar with some causes of vaccine hesitancy, which we reviewed the Tuskegee um, trial and some others, and then be familiar with the four different analogies that I found helpful um, over the course of this 18 months uh, key in a changing log, icing on the cake, safety deposit box, and Snapchat message. And so, um, one thing, quote wise, that I think is really important um, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And this was from Martin Luther King. Um, before our pandemic. And so what more, um, uh, this is true during a pandemic. And that is all I had. I wanted to say thank you. And um, I'm going to stop my share. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Edgy. I'm gonna pull back up my slides as well. Thank you to Dr. Edgy and Dr. Harris for sharing all that great information. I think that now we'll take some time to answer um, questions. Dr. Edgy or Dr. Harris, could you please address the um, question, um, if we need a booster and um, if we need a booster, the vaccine must not be working well, why should they still get it? Yes, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm in the trial for the full 25 months. And what that is, the purpose of that is for me to go ahead and get blood che uh, checked um, to see how well my antibodies are doing um, over the course of time. What we do know is that there is a slight drop off in the, um, the response of your, your body there as far as the antibody response. So the antibodies do decrease over time, but um, what we do know is if we do have a booster that gets you right back up to normal and so to where you were. So a couple of things, um, when they tried to figure out what the booster should be made of, um, they thought, well, let's try a Delta variant specific booster. If we just target Delta, does that increase the immunity um, better than let's say cutting the dose of the original in half? And what we found, I just again had my booster um, last Wednesday, what we found is that your, um, your antibody levels are actually boosted higher with half of the original dose. So that is why um, we go ahead and do that. If people did not get the booster, um, you'd still be protected, not as well, but you still be protected. And we're coming into a season where we're gonna probably have um, RSV being more prominent, um, flu being more of an issue, et cetera. So this is actually preparation. Um, to make sure that we don't have to all of a sudden say, everybody rush out and get your booster now. We're trying to make sure that we're getting that ball rolling. And then we have a few more questions um, and Dr. Karras can answer too. Um, why should I get the vaccine when I can still get COVID? And he might have had to hop off too, because I know he had another meeting. I think he's still on. Oh, I'm here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so unfortunately, no vaccine is 100% effective, but most of them are, are very effective. And our goal here is to protect as many people as we can. Uh, so getting COVID vaccine means that one, you're much more like less likely to get COVID disease. And even if you do get COVID disease, uh, you're much more you're much more likely to have a good outcome. Uh, rates of hospitalization and deaths are much, 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 much lower in people who have been vaccinated. So while COVID vaccine may not uh, protect you 100% from COVID disease, uh, it will significantly uh, lower your risk of significant um, side effects from COVID disease and even death. So uh, the best protection that we can offer all families right now is get your vaccine. Yes, and I think, you know, when you think about children in particular, um, it's one additional shield 
for them if they're not able to get vaccinated yet. So under age 12, um, if you're trying to protect that child, um, it really helps. Additionally, uh, the age groups that are hesitant right now are the ones that are taking their SATs and so on and so forth. And the side effects of COVID in that age group can be long COVID symptoms that affect their ability to have um, good memory and things like that. Um, so being vaccinated protects um, from long-term side effects, um, the full effect of which we aren't certain, and also um, protects those who are not vaccinated around you. Great, thank you. And then we had a comment um, that said that there is struggle when a parent asks, which vaccine do you think is most important? Um, and, that, and is there one um, that they should get that day? And they had said that they are all important, which is very true. Do you have any tips on, on having that conversation um, and what to do when, when that occurs? So that is certainly a common thing. We know that um, as part of the vaccine hesitancy movement, uh, there have been people who have advocated for different vaccine schedules and for delaying vaccines. And so there certainly may be families who say, all right, I know that my child is due for four vaccines, but I'm willing to do two today. Uh, so first you wanna talk about uh, the risks and benefits of getting everything done today. Uh, we know that the benefit is that the patient will be protected. Um, and the only benefits to spacing out vaccines is that, um, Right, I'm not sure that there are any. Um, <laughs> I was waiting to hear what you were going to say. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it just means that instead of one owie, they might have two, but then you have to have them come back and get a second vaccine later. And so um, I often recommend that it's better just to get it done, get it over with that way the child's all only important. Gonna, yeah. yeah, They're all important. They're only going to cry once. Um, now, if families uh, refuse and say they only want to do a limited number of vaccines that day, uh, I'm more than happy to talk about them with them about which diseases they are most likely to actually be exposed to. Um, and so if a family says, I'm willing to do two today, um, then maybe polio is not the most important because they're not going to get polio. But uh, if they're a young child, then certainly pertussis is very important. Um, certainly pneumococcal disease is very prevalent. Um, we certainly talk about chickenpox and MR. So yes, they're all very important. But there are some things that uh, are just not very prevalent. So if you want to wait a month for your meningitis, that's fine. You're probably not going to get meningitis. But let's get you your pertussis booster because we know that is in our community uh, and spreading. So. Uh, yes, they're all important, um, but sometimes some are more important than others. That's great. And then we have um, a few more questions, uh, Dr. Ajay, I think from your presentation. Where is the best places to reach our Black and Hispanic population to talk to them about the COVID-19 vac vaccine and possibly give the vaccines to them? Any ideas? Absolutely. So close the health gap or closing the health gap is... Um, is one of the best um, resources at this point in time because they actually go ahead and work with community partners. So it's like the center of a spoke um, with a wheel. So I would go ahead and just Google closing the health gap and uh, Ren Renee Mahaffey Harris is the president and CEO and it's not for profit and they go ahead and they actually have, um, I should say we, we have, um, Facebook live events on a regular basis. We have, we go into neighborhoods and have vaccine events as well. Um, so there are opportunities for speakers to come in and talk. And I think what I found over time is that really it, the conversation with hesitant individuals is not necessarily a single conversation. Somebody asked me the other day when I was speaking to a church group, um, so what is your elevator pitch for a vaccine hesitant patient? There, there is none, okay, I, I, I defy that. So it usually ends up being, um, multiple conversations over some time and making sure that there's access and availability for that to happen. I think, again, back to the issue that closing the health gap um, does provide those opportunities in multiple settings. You can bring your mom back the next time and you know if you're still hesitant, et cetera. Um, so I'd reach out. I'm certainly happy to go ahead and connect folks um, as well 
um, to close the health gap if needed. Um, so that's probably one of the best ones because they partner with every, everyone else. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Dr. Adji. And then one more question that we have is, does, do any of the childhood vaccines cause Hashimoto's disease? No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> any other questions that we can answer? Or not the not I, but Dr. G and Dr. Karis can answer before we wrap up. All of the the recording and the slides will be sent out to everyone, um, as well as a survey this week. So be on the look for that. What was the biggest surprise of um, taking part in the trial? Um, yeah. Wow, that's such a good question, Dr. Pelche. <laughs> It's just interesting, right? From from a healthcare perspective, right? Yeah. I mean, you're on the other side of this, right? I was just curious. You, know, you and I haven't talked about this. I've heard you talk many times, but I just, I, you know, from I was just curious if you had something that really took you by surprise or something that you learned that you didn't expect. Honestly, the the relief that I'd actually gotten the vaccine when I did my unblinding visit, because. Um, I mean, it, it was just a very emotional thing for me. I, as somebody who, who serves residents and, and um, fellows, I actually was pushing for them to go ahead and get all their vaccines first. Um, you know, I, that advocating for them, you know, they're very vulnerable, they're in that age group. Um, but I, you know, I found out I had been vaccinated and I found out I'd gotten Moderna. And that for me meant that I had been part of the solution to this pandemic. For me, that way, I, I had not really expected that. I, I sort of went into this with my head um, and not so much with my heart. And I literally, I cried. I'm not an emotional person per se, but I cried at that visit because I was just so happy that we could save lives. And that for me was one of the most important things we could do. Um, it, it meant Moderna could have failed. Pfizer could have failed and mm -hmm. they didn't. We had lost 700,000 lives, but we would have lost so many more if the vaccine had not worked. Yeah, that's a great... That's great. I love that you shared that. Well, I think that you, thank you both so much for presenting today, Dr. Karras and Dr. Edgy. Um, for those that love the presentation, Dr. Edgy will be presenting at the next training that we have. So we'd love for you to register um, and we're excited to share some different information with you all. And we, I will be seeing out the slides and the recording as well as the survey this week. So be on the look at, look out for that. And then please let us know if there's any questions. Um, I know Dr. Edgy has a Twitter and I think Dr. Karras might as well. So if you would like to follow them on there and um, please let us know if you have any questions. Again, thank you to CareSource for um, their support for these trainings. And my email is listed here if you need any help or um, additional information. Thank you again, Dr. Karras and Dr. Edgy. Um, and thank you all for joining us and for all the work that you do to support the children and families in Ohio. Thanks for the privilege. Thanks all. Thank you. Have a great rest of the week.